In the February-March 2017 issue of Neurology Now, one of our most popular stories is a feature about how to protect brain health from childhood through older age. In each life stage, we offer tips on diet and nutrition, exercise, sleep, mental stimulation, avoiding brain trauma, and socialization. In today's podcast, we speak with Dr. John Morris, the Harvey A. and Doris May Hacker Friedman Distinguished Professor of Neurology at Washington University in St. Louis. He's an expert in brain health and Alzheimer's disease and in ways to keep your brain healthy, as well as ways that may affect your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. I'm your host, Stephanie Stevens. Dr. Morris, it's nice to be with you. How much do family history and genetics affect brain health? We don't understand the full range of how genetics can help maintain a healthy brain. We certainly know that illnesses that affect brain health, such as Alzheimer's disease, have a strong genetic component, and it works both ways. That is, some families seem to have a genetic profile that helps protect them against Alzheimer's disease, while other families have a genetic profile that puts them more at risk. So we're trying to disentangle how genetics can help maintain a healthy brain. However, we can look at a number of families and certainly indicators of good brain health, such as intelligence, often run in a family. So clearly genetics plays a role. We hear different things about the role that certain lifestyle factors can play in helping to prevent dementia or Alzheimer's disease. What do the most credible studies suggest about that association? For example, what does the research tell us about exercise? So physical exercise has a lot of good studies that show that it is associated with uh, protection against Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Additionally, we have uh, a number of studies that suggest keeping the mind active is good for uh, protection against Alzheimer's. And finally, people who tend to stay socially engaged, interactive with other people, also may have protection against Alzheimer's disease. But you said it a very important word, association. All of these studies have looked at groups of individuals who do or do not have Alzheimer's disease. The groups of individuals that do not have Alzheimer's disease tend to engage in mental exercises, physical exercises, and social activities much more than the group of people who do have Alzheimer's disease. So you might think that those lifestyle factors are protecting against Alzheimer's disease. What we don't know, however, is whether the people who are, say, playing Sudoku or playing bridge and less likely to get Alzheimer's disease, perhaps were born with a bigger, better, more protected brain. And it's that bigger, better brain that led them to do two things. One, to play Sudoku, and two, to be protected against Alzheimer's. In that case, it wouldn't be the Sudoku that protected them. It's simply the manifestation that they had a bigger brain. So we're still trying to work all that out. It certainly is the case that staying physically active, mentally active, and socially engaged cannot hurt. It may help, but we can't guarantee it at this point. So many factors to consider. So how about nutrition? Are there certain diets that are better for the brain than others? A great deal of information suggests that diets that favor fish, and vegetables and fruit, such as the Mediterranean diet, are perhaps more protective against Alzheimer's disease than diets that favor uh, red meat and uh, starches and so forth. In other words, the diets that favor things that really taste good may not be good for us. So we have to be careful to maintain a healthy diet. And a good rule of thumb is what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So we certainly are promoting healthy diet. There are a number of intriguing studies that certain particular dietary factors, antioxidants for one, perhaps uh, red wine and alcohol for two, at least in moderation, may have unique protective factors. So we don't know that we can promote that people who have a healthy diet, again, will be protected against Alzheimer's, but once again, it certainly won't hurt and it may help. 
So let's talk about the research again, if we might. What are researchers learning about the role of sleep in promoting brain health or reducing the risk of dementia or Alzheimer's disease? This has become a very interesting and potentially very exciting area of research. We think that sleep and Alzheimer's disease go together in both directions. That is, people who have Alzheimer's disease have poor sleep, and people who have poor sleep may be at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So trying to understand this bi-directional interaction between sleep and Alzheimer's has become a very fertile area of research. We know, for example, that people who have fragmented sleep are less likely to be able to control in a reasonable amount the normal brain cell release of a protein amyloid beta that we think is important for developing Alzheimer's disease. So people with poor sleep seem to release more of this amyloid beta into the brain fluid than perhaps people who get better sleep, and perhaps that puts them more at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And we know that people who do not yet have Alzheimer's dementia but do have the beginning changes of Alzheimer's disease in the brain are more likely to experience poor sleep. So once again, there's this intriguing connection and it opens up a potentially a new therapeutic area. That is where we might find uh, ways to target better sleep in hopes of trying to reduce risk of Alzheimer's disease. Let's move to smoking and drinking and too much stress. Now, what effect do they have on the brain? The best evidence really has to do with alcohol, and even there, it is uh, sort of a a difficult area to really understand precisely. There have been studies about the relationship of tobacco use and Alzheimer's disease. Some of the early studies seem to show that tobacco use, smoking, uh, might be protective against Alzheimer's disease, but then with a little more careful analysis of the information, it appeared that people who smoked in general died before they reached the age of Alzheimer's and those smokers who lived to the age at which they might develop Alzheimer's disease might have been protected in some way. But most people who uh, smoke uh, have many more immediate health risks than living to the age where they might develop Alzheimer's disease. Stress has, has been very controversial as well. There are studies in experimental models using uh, specially genetically engineered mice, so they are at increased risk of developing brain changes of Alzheimer's, that if they are placed in a stressful environment, they, again, are more likely to develop those brain lesions, particularly that amyloid beta. So there are intriguing interactions between stress and smoking and Alzheimer's disease. As I said, the most information that we have to date appears to be uh, alcohol. The original report suggested that moderate use of red wine could be protective against Alzheimer's disease. It since has been extended that uh, alcohol itself may have some protective factor, but it is a dangerous area to try to prescribe because what is meant by moderate use, and that varies per individual. And we know that too much uh, alcohol is harmful to the brain. So we don't really fully understand from a practical standpoint what might be the proper levels of alcohol intake, but at least there are data that indicate that at least a limited use of alcohol may be protective. So what happens to the brain in the late stages of life in terms of shrinkage and the risk of dementia? The original idea was that as people age, they would lose brain cells and hence the brain would shrink in size. We call that atrophy. What we now believe happens is we don't lose brain cells. The number of brain cells stays the same, but the size of the brain cells themselves may shrink so that with age, there is very strong evidence that some brain shrinkage occurs and it doesn't begin in late life. It begins around the age of 30. So throughout most of the adult lifespan, the brain slowly is shrinking, not because of loss of nerve cells, but because nerve cells naturally shrink as they age. We think that they still 
function well in healthy aging. That's why healthy older adults are able to remain independent in terms of their cognitive abilities. They don't rely on others to uh, help them get through their usual activities. But in illnesses such as Alzheimer's, then the Alzheimer process causes brain cells to die. That is the ultimate lesion in Alzheimer's disease, loss of brain cells, these neurons or nerve cells that have the responsibility for all of our brain uh, function. So in Alzheimer's disease, the atrophy, the shrinkage is accelerated beyond that which we find in, in healthy brain aging. How close are we, do you think, to discovering ways to actually prevent Alzheimer's disease? Well, this is an exciting area that has been developed in the past five years, and that is while we will always try to develop effective therapies for people who have developed Alzheimer's disease dementia, the new paradigm is can we prevent Alzheimer's disease dementia? I indicated earlier that some healthy older adults, and I would say it's about a third of individuals who are 70 and older, are already developing the brain lesions of Alzheimer's disease in the absence of any symptoms. That is, they have the brain changes occurring, but the brain changes have not yet reached a point where they start to cause brain cells to die. Hence, the individuals have these brain changes, but are perfectly cognitively normal. So the idea now is perhaps we shouldn't wait until those brain changes cause the nerve cells, the neurons to die before we initiate therapy, because then we're treating a irreversibly damaged brain. Perhaps we ought to intervene at the stage prior to the loss of brain cells, neurons, and the appearance of symptoms and try to treat these healthy older adults who have the brain changes in hopes of delaying the onset of dementia or perhaps preventing it altogether. And I'm pleased to say that those trials have been launched, treatments that target this brain protein amyloid beta that we think is critical to the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease, but looking at healthy people who we know are at accelerated risk of developing Alzheimer's dementia. And the two main groups of healthy people that have been targeted are people who carry a rare gene that will mean that they develop Alzheimer's dementia. We can identify those individuals who carry that gene that will cause Alzheimer's disease before the dementia appears and trials of anti-amyloid therapies are underway in these very rare groups of individuals with this family mutation that causes Alzheimer's disease. But also trials have now begun for the far more common form of Alzheimer's disease that isn't linked to a gene mutation. These are healthy older people who are at risk for becoming demented because we can tell that the brain changes have started to occur. We detect these brain changes by sophisticated imaging technique called a positron emission tomography or a PET scan, or we uh, examine the proteins of the brain, including amyloid beta, in an analysis of the cerebral spinal fluid. So if you're a healthy older person, 70 and older, and you may think that you're at risk for developing Alzheimer's, uh, some of these trials will a screen to see whether you have a positive PET scan or a positive spinal fluid analysis, meaning that with time you're at elevated risk for becoming demented, but those people are eligible now to start prevention therapies, starting to take anti-amyloid treatments to see if the dementia can be delayed or even prevented. So I think it's a very exciting time in the Alzheimer field that we now are not only trying to develop therapies to help people who have symptomatic Alzheimer's, but now trying to treat people who have asymptomatic Alzheimer's. That is very exciting. Thank you, Dr. Morris. To read the article, Protect Your Brain for Life in the February-March issue, visit neurologynow.com and type the name of the article into the search bar. 
or subscribe free of charge to Neurology Now, the official publication of the American Academy of Neurology. Thanks for joining us today for our podcast with Dr. John Morris. I'm Stephanie Stevens.